A few years ago, a friend shared the story with me about this wonderful little village by a river. And one day, this young man sees somebody struggling, drowning in the river. And he doesn't even think he jumps into the river and saves this person. He becomes the local hero. A few days later, he sees somebody else in the river. He jumps in and saves that person. And he realizes he can't save everybody. So he trains some of his friends on how to swim, how to rescue people. They actually create a little school for training. It's kind of restrictive. It's a club. After about three years, they actually let some young women in. And they become well-known because they're saving people not only in the daytime. They create some infrared scanners to find people in the river at night. And they go in at night and rescue these people. So people come from other towns by rivers, pay a lot of money because saving lives is important. And they create this school, a life-saving school. And they give people prestigious titles when they graduate and long white coats to wear. And one of the people who was saved three years before has become a famous fashion designer and she gives them a billion dollars to build a new school. And other people have been saved, give them money for new technology, speedboats and nets and everything. And people come from all over the world to the school and they have this grand opening. And they have, you know, the typical celebration, marching bands and important people giving speeches, even fireworks. At the end of the night, this little 11 year old girl is just in awe. She walks over to the new dean of the school and she says, has anyone ever gone upstream to find out why so many people keep falling in the river? I have described our healthcare system. <laughs> so today I want to talk about health, not health care. How we keep people out of the river. Prevention, not cure. And the hardest part, by far the heart, hardest part, is implementation, not studies, not more journal articles. Not things my healthcare friends take, tell me it takes 17 years from the time evidence in a prestigious journal proves without a doubt that this is a better way to take care of somebody before it's actually implemented. That is ridiculous. I have never ever seen anything in healthcare happen that fast. <laughs> like most people, I'm the product of the random life, walk of life. I was working happily at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey, head of the quality theory and technology department, coming up with all sorts of new stuff that has made all our lives so wonderful that we don't connect with the earth, we just stay with our phones. But this young doctor wanted to come visit. He had been asked to become vice president of Harvard Community Health Plan. He was a professor at Harvard. He was supposed to be vice president of quality. He didn't know what quality was. He went to some hospitals. He hated what he saw. It was like find the bad nurse or the bad doctor and punish them because somebody must have done something wrong. And so he wanted to know if we did anything different in manufacturing. So I organized a bunch of meetings and he spent eight hours wandering around talking to people. At the end of the day, I asked him, I said, do we do anything differently from healthcare? And he looked at me and laughed and said, everything. He said, there was nothing I heard today that we do in healthcare. This was 30 years ago. So Don and I, Don Berwick, this is the original story I stole from him. He and I created this simple little project. We would invite 21 of the top healthcare providers in the country to play a little game. I love gamifying, like we heard earlier. And we'd invite 25 of the top manufacturing companies, you know, at that time, Ford, IBM, Corning, all the companies that had won prestigious quality awards are really doing wonderful things to share what they had done. And the, the goal was that the hospitals, if they came, they had to have a problem they're willing to try to solve using manufacturing methods. And in six months, they had to report back success or failure what actually happened. Well, 15 of the 21 were incredibly successful. So we put their stories in this book called Care and Healthcare. And nobody wanted to stop the project, so we went on another three years, and then they didn't want to stop the project, so it evolved to something called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a little not-for-profit in Boston with 220 full-time employees now, with partners all over the world. But we've been very hospital-focused, so we really help with cure, but we don't do anything to keep you out of the hospital. And most of you know that the United Nations has created these wonderful goals, the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. 
and a friend of mine from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the Gillings School of Global Public Health came and asked if I would help them with goal three. They had been asked by the United Nations, their United Nations WHO coordinating center, to help them with reducing maternal mortality, reducing child mortality. Just to give you the numbers, 300,000 women die a year in childbirth. Most countries have reduced their maternal to mortality rate by over 50% in the last 15 years. The United States has increased by 50%. The worst statistic is 5.4 million children die every year from diseases we know how to prevent. So I've been in the College of Textiles for a long time, so what I know a lot about now is textiles. I didn't before, but I'm learning. And textiles, just like the rest of healthcare, has focused on the hospital market. I mean, it's a really good market. It's $1.2 trillion. And the consumer only pays 3% of that. So you've got a trillion dollar market that people don't care what anything costs. So that's the market you want to sell to. So you sell heart valves, you sell vascular grafts, you sell other things. One of our professors actually back in 1954 created the first vascular graph. Didn't patent it, that was the days before university greed and just gave it away all over the world. And the story goes that the dean three years later actually received one of these, so he calls Dr. Shen in his office and he says, Dr. Shen, am I gonna get a warranty? And Shen was really quick, he said, yes sir, lifetime. One of our PhD graduates held up a little stint when I visited his company, and he said, $10,000. And then he smiled and he said, much better margin than socks. So why wouldn't you chase this market? Why wouldn't you let the Chinese make the socks and the shirts and the t-shirts when there's somebody who's gonna pay you $10,000 for a little woven product? And the medical textile world is also big, the bandages, the, the gowns, the sheets, the compression stockings, everything else. There are 15,000 medical textile companies in America feeding this trillion dollar business. But we've used textiles to protect for years. We make firefighter suits. We make firefighters safe for 25, 000, 25 seconds of flash. And while firefighters, and we protect for chemical and bio agents. We protect policemen. We make bulletproof and knife-proof vests. You can even buy your fashion product if you'd like to wear your Givenchy bulletproof vest. We will even save your dog. And in your car, we make airbags and we make seat belts to try to keep you out of the hospital. We make motorcycle jackets and helmets and gloves. I love, not everything works. They actually put airbags in a motorcycle jacket. I mean, think about this. You hit something, you fly through the air, you blow up like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you bounce along the street until an 18-wheeler squashes you like a bug. But don't forget your cat. We have helmets and jackets for the cat, too. And never, ever jump out of a plane without your textiles or off a cliff. But there's so much new stuff. One of our students almost got killed twice on his bicycle at night because people didn't see him. So for a senior project at Fashion Show, he puts LEDs in his jacket. Well, some venture capitalists saw this and thought this was a great idea and gave him some money. And then somebody else in California gave him more money. So he now has three utility patents and he has a design patent because he's connected the jacket with your smartphone. So you just tell Google Maps where you want to go. And when you want to turn right, your right arm lights up as a turn signal. When you want to go left, when you slow down, your butt's a big brake light. If you're a runner, you strobe when you're across the street. So construction workers, crossing guards, other people are very interested in this jacket. He thought it was just for bicycle riders. And it's those of us who have had a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism and almost died in the hospital love this product. We wouldn't go anywhere without our compression stockings and our, our blood thinners. But the researchers are now putting the sensors in them so they can adjust your ankle and your calf to get you the right pressure. And then they're connecting to your phone, so it's like a little ultra scan. You can watch your blood go through your legs. And then they told me you're using some of the activated fibers they're doing for the Army for the artificial muscle. They're gonna put the fibers in the socks, 
so that if you don't get a good blood throw, flow on a long plane trip, you just hit the button and you get a massage. So I'm sorry, Vernie, but we're going to put you out of business. But we haven't solved all the problems. Our hospitals still kill 72,000 people a year through infections, 200 a day. You have a 1 in 31 chance of getting an infection if you go to the hospital. 170 years ago, Simone Whites in Vienna and Wendell, Oliver Wendell Holmes in Boston started looking at hand washing. We know that hand washing really reduces the doctors and nurses spreading the infections from room to room. In 150 years, we finally standardized on that. We're pretty, getting, pretty good on that, but we still carry infection around other ways. We carry it every time the doctor walks in. You don't want to put their lab coat under a microscope. So in Great Britain, they've outlawed long sleeves and long ties because they know how much we've been spreading. So what if our sheets and our blankets, like the gift was just given away, what if we killed the bacteria and the viruses and the fungi? What if we had another step forward to reducing these 72,000 infection deaths a year? What if we actually protected people in the hospitals and even let them take the stuff home because not all of us wash our sheets and hot water and chlorine every night, even if we're recovering from a hospital surgery. So what do we do? So I want to end on a happier note. I want to end on progress. The first picture isn't happy, but it's serious. For centuries, the earth was ravaged by smallpox. 300 million to 500 million people died in the 20th century, not that long ago, from smallpox. And yet, Edward Jenner, Dr. Jenner in 1798, invented the vaccine for smallpox. It only took us 170 years to implement. But in 1975, the last case of smallpox was recorded in India. And a wonderful book by Bill Feige, who was at the CDC, loaned to help run this project. The last push was in India. The Ministry of Health, World Health Organization, CDC from the United States, 60,000 people on the ground. It's not easy to get needles in 6 billion people in the world. It's not easy to make this kind of progress, but smallpox is gone. We want to make an impact, prevent disease, not cure for everybody after they get smallpox. Let's get rid of it. And I love this slide. Two of my favorite people, I don't know them, but I admire them. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And I love this slide because the story is that they were in Hong Kong and Warren offered to take Bill to lunch. But it had to be McDonald's because he had a coupon. And that's true. But Bill and Melinda wrote a love letter to Warren a couple years ago. And the first line of the letter was 122 million children are alive today because of you. Because as most of you know, Warren Buffett has given most of his fortune to the Gates Foundation which is focused on reducing childhood diseases all over the world to give people a chance. And since 1990, the world has gone from 18% of children being vaccinated before school to 86%. And the best estimate of the 122 million children are alive today because of that. Now, 86%, we still have a way to go, even in the United States. Anybody watches the news about measles? And there's some countries still at war, some countries with real problems. Three people doing vaccinations for polio were killed in the country three weeks ago. It's not easy. Implementation is not easy, but we know the solution. We have the vaccinations that prevent the childhood diseases that kill children. It's just getting them to people. And there's problems we haven't solved that we have solutions for. Malaria still infects 700 million people a year. 1,200 children a, die, a day die from malaria. And we know what works. This is your test question, name all the viruses. Um, we won't do that. We know the bed nets work. We know the protective clothing works. We have different ways of making the clothing. We even make maternity clothes for any area that's infected with Zika virus. We 
make good looking clothes for backpackers and hikers and we make clothes for your dog and your horse. And this is just a group of children thanking the people who have delivered the nets because they know it will save their lives. We know how to stop these problems. So the other big problem, of course, is water. A billion people in the world don't have clean water, even some in our country. Two and a half billion don't have good sanitation. We know it kills. We know it kills. 1.2 million children a year die from waterborne diseases. But people are doing something. This is my favorite solution. This is called Life Straw. It's a straw that filters the water while you drink. These are being distributed to villages throughout the world. It's a simple, very cheap thing. Children celebrating having their straws. But even better, I love this one. This is a village filter system run by two women. They charge a reasonable price for the clean water. They use their profits to invest in farming and gardening and so forth. Here's one in the home. I love this one. Here's your instruction manual for how to filter water. And you can tear out every page because it's a filter. And then, thanks to the Carter Foundation, it looks like guinea worm will be the first disease totally eradicated without a vaccine. We know how to filter out the parasites. So I'm a statistician. I work in a college of textiles. So how can I help? Well, the one thing I'm good at is data analysis. I know how to look at big data. So that's my part. We're taking the idea from World War II, the war room, lots of D-Day stuff going on in the news now, so planning for the invasion. You wouldn't think of planning without having the war room and people organized and knowing what they're actually doing. And so think of NASA. Could you actually get to the moon and back without having your command and control center where everybody's connected together? So this is what we're building. We're building a lab. We call it a data interactive visualization or utilization lab. We're building one in every country. We want to share because we know how to do these things. All we have to do is connect everybody. And we've talked a lot about connection. to. We need to connect people to the best practices. So the people in Ghana can share in Zambia how they've reduced maternal mortality by 50%, how China has reduced it by 90%. We can learn so much from them. And these are the labs that we're building. This is Oxford University. They've pinpointed where the malaria deaths are so we can focus on where to take the nets and the protective gear. We know where to go. Believe it or not, in Bangladesh, the third leading cause of death is drowning. We can go back to our first story. They're doing swimsuits and life-saving. And so these are just students working in the visualization labs that we have. We're just trying to change things so we can share with everybody what's happening. We're not the experts. The experts are the people out there who have actually done it, the people who have saved the lives. So how can we share? How can we change the implementation from 175 years or 100 years, or 17 years, to next year. So that's all we're talking about is impact, so thanks.